This is Packernet. I am your celebrity guest host, JJ Leahy. Check us out online at packernet.com. Follow me on Twitter at JJ Leahy. Well, since it's the off season and uh, interest in football is at an all time low, you may or may not have noticed that the regularly scheduled programming over here at uh, the Packernet podcast has been somewhat off. Ryan is uh, very busy getting his family moved into a new house. I have been on the road for uh, a couple weeks now, really. But uh, this is the time to do it. We have uh, 38 days left, I believe, until Packers training camp. This is the time of year where we're pretty much just hoping for no news because other players around the league are getting themselves arrested right now. Yeah, so what we would like to see is uh, all of our players, especially the young guys, just uh, take some time off, go chill in um, Hawaii with uh, Aaron Rodgers or the Bahamas, Thailand, I don't know, take that money, just go relax on a beach, stay out of trouble. It'd be nice if you're, you know, practicing football and getting ready for the season, but but I'm not picky. You know, right now is the time when I'm all in favor of guys going and chill on the beach. We got... Over a month before we got to do anything, I, I think if it was me um, and I had this chunk of time here, I'm probably taking my wife. I don't have any kids yet, but I think we're going to go uh, probably to Europe. Uh, let me see if uh, Europe is open. Can you travel to Europe yet? I'd like to go to Italy. Let's see. Uh, 14 hours ago, NPR.com, EU lifts ban on American travelers. So that's convenient. That That's where I go. The wife's been wanting to go to Italy for a while, and in this um, imaginary scenario, I'm an NFL player with Buku Bucks. We're going to Italy. By the way, thank you so much to the one person, that would be uh, Mr. Eric Couch, who responded to my request for burger recipes and burger tips. I was a little bit disappointed that, you know, we didn't get more than one response. Super appreciate Eric, but... Listen, I checked the numbers, the, the download numbers on that episode, and it was right near the beginning of the episode, so it's not even like I, I bored people with football talk and they didn't get to the grilling thing. If you got uh, burger tips, come on, hit me up. I'm on Twitter, at JJ Leahy. I am on Facebook. Uh, name you there is just JJ Leahy. Shoot me a message. Give me some, uh, some grilling tips for burgers, some recipes. Uh, Eric sent me a recipe he had tried for a homemade Big Mac, and I haven't done it yet, uh, mostly because uh, I already had all my meals planned out for the rest of the week, but uh, that is going to be happening. I'm going to try that. Okay, I asked for uh, questions for the podcast uh, kind of late last night. By the time I went to bed, there just were not enough questions to do a podcast, and they are kind of trickling in. Um, however... I think I'm going to save those for tomorrow's episode because there's been a decent amount of news lately and uh, Ryan's been AWOL. So let's let's cover some of this. First of all, a shout out to Mr. Jeff Nelson, who posted in the Facebook group. They listened to his first ever Packernet podcast. His assessment is that it's not too shabby. I agree. It's not too shabby. Also, a big shout out. This episode is sponsored by Bearded Buck. They're a uh, local Wisconsin based company that uh, sells beard care products, which I think is cool. And I'm not even Wisconsin based. I live in, in Michigan. I live deep in the heart of uh, Detroit Lions territory, which stinks. Uh, by the way, if anybody wants to contribute to my uh, visit Lambo and see a game there fund, you know, hit me up, uh, toss a couple bucks my way, uh, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, whatever. I, I'm i not picky. I go watch the Packers at uh, Ford Field every year. I would really like to change that this year. My, my plan was to go watch the uh, Cleveland Browns game at Lambeau this year. However, that's going to be on Christmas Day, and that just is, does not work for my schedule. Um, love football. Um, also love my family. And my family is not going to be traveling on Christmas Day. So, uh, okay, got to pick a different game to go to. I grew up in Ohio, and I'm very fond of the Browns for that reason. That's why that game would have been a lot of fun. Um, plus, the Browns are kind of just a fun team right now. I'm not sure what game I want to go see this year. Um, hopefully, I can make that happen. 
And if you want to support the show itself, you can uh, donate to Ryan's Patreon. He's got a link in the show notes. And for all your Packers news, head to Packernet.com. That's actually the first place I go every time I'm about to record any Packers podcast. I go to Packernet.com because it's just laid out right there. Just super convenient. So it's a aggregation of all Packers news. A lot of great articles and videos just readily accessible. And you can follow me on Twitter, um, breaking Packers news all day long. Little bite-sized uh, immediate announcements. You'd be surprised how often throughout the week a team in the NFL signs a former Packer. That that tends to be one of the more common uh, bits of news that uh, I, I report on. Most recently, Darius Shepard is now a Kansas City Chief. So Mr. August gets another shot. The Bears also signed uh, defensive tackle Mike Pennell. You'd be forgiven if you don't remember him. He was not here very long. He was on the roster for two years, played for the Packers for like a year and two games, basically. But then he did go win a Super Bowl with the Kansas City Chiefs. So there is that. So the big thing everybody's talking about is that Aaron Rodgers renewed his membership with the Green Bay Country Club for another year. I get it. I I don't think this is how he sends the signal he's coming back. My immediate thought in all of this was that he probably just doesn't know if he's coming back, but he likes the club and it was, you know, time to uh, pay up or get kicked out of the club. And dude has Scrooge McDuck money. And then I wondered, and this is probably the slightly less realistic scenario, I wondered is this just an auto pay thing? I don't have anywhere near the amount of money that Aaron Rodgers has. And I've got plenty of things on auto pay that I don't think about that auto renew. And I get the charge and I go, ah, ah, meant to cancel that. And sometimes, maybe I'm alone in this. Sometimes I didn't, it's not even like I was going to cancel it, but I, I just didn't want it to renew without me deciding that I wanted to recommit for another year. Um, or another month. Uh, T- and tends to be software is the thing that uh, I hate that everything's going to a subscription based model like software. Th- this is a big thing. Um, and it's, uh, I guess, particularly relevant to me because I kind of work in the industry a little bit. And um, there was a company that I was considering applying to work for. I have used their software in the past and a bunch of years ago, I was a big fan of it. Haven't, I mean, it's been at least a decade since I was using their software, but I was, I was talking to a um, current employee of theirs and, you know, she really enjoyed the culture there. She was kind of trying to talk me into applying there. And then she mentioned that they were switching over to a subscription based model for their services. And I thought this is a software that I would use like once a year. But you want you want me to pay for a yearly subscription to this thing? I don't know, not my cup of tea. So I tweeted that theory out and was promptly met with people saying you can't auto renew a country club. Which okay, fair. I have never been part of a country club. I wouldn't know. But then Mr. Will Blackman tweeted out basically the same theory, and uh, I think Will Blackman does have enough money to know. Well, it's probably a case by case thing i'm sure not every country club handles it the same way but if will blackman is suggesting that aaron Rodgers has auto renew on for this country club and they just charged his credit card um i'm gonna defer to him and then the what's packing sports show i believe his the host name is uh i think he calls himself godson <laughs> he left a, a hilarious comment on my post i'm i can't read the whole thing um, but he, he <laughs> uh, let me see here. What are the, what are the G rated parts of this that I can read? Dude owns part of the bucks. He has to be a country club member. That's where they discuss the Illuminati plans. But seriously, you think 12 was calling up the club with his black card every year, reading him the CV code on the back, <laughs> which is <laughs> a hilarious, uh, visual, um, by the way, I highly doubt Aaron Rodgers actually manages his own finances and um, is calling up <laughs> places reading off off the uh, CCV code on the back of his card. 
That having been said, his accountant probably asked if he wanted to renew his membership. And I think at a bare minimum, whether he was planning to come back to the Packers or not, but especially since it's, it is definitely up in the air a bit, I just have to imagine that he at least just thought about the club and thought, yeah, I like being part of the club. Uh, I don't really want my membership to expire over all this. Let's go ahead and give it one more year because I have so much money, it doesn't even matter. I mean, do I really need to say it? A, a country club membership for Aaron Rodgers is a Netflix subscription for me. Uh, the Bears have submitted a bid to purchase the Arlington Racecourse property. The mayor of Chicago released a statement ripping the Bears, and uh, she she did take the tweet down almost immediately, but sorry, lady, screenshots exist. Our home is, our city is home to some of the world's finest sports teams. Sure, whatever. I agree to disagree. Um, but, uh, as part of the city's recovery, many organizations are doubling down on their commitment to Chicago, and we expect the Chicago Bears to follow suit. The Bears are locked into a lease at Soldier Field. She even, there's a typo here. It's, it's She said Solider Field. Whatever. At Soldier Field until 2033. I mean, come on, it's only 12 years away. That's not biggest deal the the la chargers signed a 60-year lease with the la rams either 50 or 60 60 sounds more correct i would love for the chargers to move to a city that actually wants them um but but that 60-year lease is a big deal 12 years is not the biggest deal here in addition this announcement from the bears comes in the midst of negotiations for improvements at soldier field i don't think Most of us in the public knew about that. She calls it a negotiating tactic the Bears have used before. She says she's committed to keeping the Chicago name in her football team or in our football team. And like most Bears fans, we want the organization to focus on putting a winning team on the field, beating the Packers finally, and being relevant past October. Everything else is noise. I'm convinced that the Bears at this point just are jealous of the attention the Packers are getting, albeit negative attention with the Aaron Rodgers thing, and are just determined to create as many headlines as possible to steal the spotlight back on them. I think they are irritated that the negative attention they are used to receiving is being heaped on the Packers, and they want it back. Having said that, I think the Bears should move. Not away from Chicago, but move, I mean, I I guess the the Arlington property is not the worst um, idea, but they, the location of Soldier Field kind of sucks. There are some things about Soldier Field that are very charming, and if you um, brought them over with you to the new property, I mean, not literally brought them, but, you know, rebuilt them over at, at the new property that they would be cool, but it's, it's a uh, not a great location. They're kind of hemmed in on all sides with no room to expand. The fan experience at soldier field just isn't the greatest beyond that. I heard, um, oh, who was it? Some Packers media member was griping about the press boxes being like way off to the side and hard to access. And, uh, I think they said that the, the building just has a uh, overall a big, just like uh, government office building feel to it. I I actually really do applaud the idea of the Bears moving. You know, just look, you got a, a hot young quarterback. There have been talks about the Bears or about the uh, McCaskey family selling the Bears I think they are as sick of the funk they have been in as their fans are. Build a new stadium. Come on, create some uh, excitement and interest from fans and the media. Um, you know, but Give yourselves the opportunity with enough real estate around you to expand, not just vertically, but uh, in all directions, that you could do something like uh, the, the title town district that, um, that the Packers are doing. I love this statement by the mayor just trashing the Bears organization because I'm a Packer fan. 
And yes, she's right. The the Bears should be focused on trying to put together a a winning team. And also, at the end of the day, I think moving is a great idea. They should do it. Aaron Nagler tweeted, I believe, that uh, he had heard, and I actually think I remember hearing about this and just kind of forgot about it, that the uh, golfing segment with uh, Brady and whoever the other guys are, I, I don't care, where he was wearing the I'm Offended shirt, that that was pre-taped and had been taped before Mark Murphy's complicated fella comments. Which, in a vacuum, minus the Mark Murphy comments, what would we have thought that that, meant that shirt was about? I mean, this is not hardly the first time that Aaron has shown up wearing a shirt that um, seems... Uh, a little out of touch with the his surroundings and maybe pokes fun at other people. I think we might just, you know, take this as part of his personality. I mean, it fits with him. You know, if you if you don't have the Mark Murphy comments hanging over everything, I'm not sure there's any obvious Packers correlation that you would make there. And in fact, he's talking to Tom Brady, who has been ripping him for all of 2021 just needling him every chance he gets, constantly talking trash about Aaron Rodgers, making fun of him for the uh, the field goal, just needling him over and over again. I, I I do believe it's all in good fun. I they they appear to be friends in real life. Whether this was pre-taped or not, I, I don't know for sure. <laughs> I tried doing a search to, for uh, Aaron Rodgers and the word pre-taped. And the only results I was getting was tweets from myself about the Aaron Rodgers interview on Kenny Main. So that wasn't helpful. So PFF highlighted that Bob Tunyon has zero drops in the last two years. I think he had 89 receptions and, uh, sorry, no, he had an 89% completion rating. He had 62 receptions and zero drops. Which is pretty good. Um, in case you're wondering, the reason he has an 89% completion rating and zero drops, there's this thing called incompletions. And the reason I'm bringing that up at all is because that is the uh, thought process that I had to go through with myself. He's the only tight end in the league last year who had 50 or more catches and zero drops. So that's pretty cool. We did hear from Matt LaFleur that uh, he's planning on trying to get Tunyon more involved in the offense this year, make him a bigger part of it, especially down in the red zone. BFF has an article where they rank the top tight ends in the league. They are listing for the 2021 season, they are ranking Tunyon as the 15th best tight end in the league. Um, for fantasy football purposes... If Jordan Love is the starter, traditionally, um, rookie quarterbacks tend to favor their tight ends. There's big, reliable, dependable targets, uh, especially in the red zone. Now, unfortunately, that was not the case with Justin Jefferson last year. Um, I took uh, Hunter Henry, thinking that I was going to really benefit from Herbert's rookie season, and that was not the case. Which makes me wonder how good he's going to be with the Patriots. He's 26 and a half, super young, uh, 69.3 overall grade in 2020, which is significantly lower than I thought he would be at. He had a 73.2 in 2019. Um, holy crap. I don't remember him taking the entire 2018 year off. He was hurt, wasn't he? Uh, 2017, 87.2. And uh, 86.7 receiving grade. Uh, so that was his last elite year. It was 2017. 2016, 83 grade. 2015, I don't think he was even in the league back then. He wasn't. So uh, 2016 was his first year, and he was elite. And then he was elite. His second year was out all year. His third year, his fourth and fifth years, he was kind of just average. So... Uh, it's a weird career path for a guy to take. Uh, I don't know if that 2018 year just really messed up his development or or if he 
I've never heard of him having lingering issues uh, injury-wise or anything, but the dude did take a massive step back. He had 613 receiving yards last year, 60 receptions, uh, four touchdowns. I mean, his stats aren't horrific, but we talk about him as being one of the top tight ends in the league. Like, you got your big three. Uh, Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Zach Ertz up until last year, I think, I think he probably would say Darren Waller is now the other member of the big three. And then right behind them is like Hunter Henry. Um, anyways, just something to chew on. Well, I'm way overdue taking our first ad break, so I'll just get this out of the way and then I'll be right back. You're listening to the Packernet Podcast. Have you ever tried installing a security camera in your house or apartment? The wires, the brackets, the screws. It's a mess, and it takes half your day. And if you rent, good luck convincing your landlord that the holes you drilled were a necessary improvement. That's why the Bodyguards 360 security camera was so awesome to find. The camera rotates to give you a 360-degree view of the room, so you only need one camera to eliminate blind spots that you might get from other cameras. You can set it up in seconds because it doesn't require wires or brackets, and you can keep an eye on all your prized possessions all day long through an app. It's great. I can see what's going on in my home whenever I want, no matter where I am. You can get up to 30 bucks off the camera by going to bodyguards.com slash AC Sports. It's a little tricky, though. You spell bodyguards with a Z. B-O-D-Y-G-U-A-R-D-Z dot com slash AC Sports. Use promo code AC Sports to get 30 bucks off today. The Fall Line is a true crime podcast covering the coldest cases in the southeastern United States and occasionally beyond. We focus on the missing persons, the unsolved murders, and the unidentified does that don't get media attention. Empathetic and intensively researched, The Fall Line will take you on deep dives into unsolved cases that you've never heard of and make you wonder why you haven't. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts. I am saving questions for... um tomorrow's episode which I, I may end up recording today still um but here's a couple questions that i thought were just interesting that are kind of just on my mind today uh what are the expectations for devin funches um this is something that we've gone over like a billion times already but then i thought well i haven't really talked about like actual hard stats like what are you actually expecting from funches this year First of all, let's just hope he makes the team. There's a lot we don't know about his physical condition. I mean, he has not played football in two years, almost three years. Obviously, we everybody at this point knows that he opted out of the 2020 season. He was hurt the entirety of the 2019 season. He played in the first game, got hurt halfway through a mediocre first game. He has not played a game since... 2018, and I believe he didn't actually finish the 2018 season. So step number one for this guy is just make the roster. If he can make the roster, then that says a lot about the coach's um, confidence in his abilities and his um, uh, the, the physical shape he's in because he's taking somebody else's job. We have too many wide receivers. I'm not complaining about that. Devontae Adams, Devin Funches, Alan Lazard, Equinemia St. Brown, Marcos Valdez-Scantling, Amari Rogers. Then you got the uh, way more depth guys, Juwan Winfrey. Uh, I guess Malik Taylor made the roster last year. He's a, a big special teams contributor. Maybe Funches takes his job and guys elsewhere on the team are special teams contributors. I know that the plan is for Amari Rogers to be handling the returns pretty much entirely. I don't think they're going to move on from Malik Taylor. I think the Packers really like him. Um, Bailey Gaither, Chris Blair, Reggie Begleton, um, DeAndre Tompkins. But unless the Packers are keeping seven wide receivers, you're looking at probably a guy like Equinemius losing his job to Funches. I think those two guys are, are battling for the last wide receiver roster spot. 
I think one of Malik Taylor, Devin Funches, and uh, Equinemius do not make the cut. Or else the Packers have to keep seven wide receivers. And I know a lot of people would just immediately jump to Malik Taylor being the guy who gets the axe. I would not be so sure about that. Remember, none of the other wide receivers are contributing on special teams. Like, not actually. And that is the reason that Malik Taylor made the, re- made the roster last year was for his uh, special teams work. Now, if Funchess makes the team, um, let's see, his best year ever, he had eight touchdowns. However, it looks like four is about the average he had. But I mean, there's not a big sample size here. He has four seasons where he had touchdowns. Five, four, eight, four. So let's call a good year for him. Uh, five, I think uh, four. The problem is that there were not a ton of other receivers in Carolina when he was there. I mean, he was not wide receiver one. Maybe his last year there, he was supposed to be wide receiver one. But he usually was wide receiver two or three. If if he is still good, if he doesn't have you know the rust on him, if he doesn't have um, you know issues from being out of the league for a while, and he makes the roster, I think that that Green Bay could be a good long term home for Funchess. I think it's a great signing for that reason. Uh. Could he be putting up consistent wide receiver two numbers for us? Um, I mean, in theory, yes, but his numbers are very similar to Alan Lazard and MVS. Now, they are better, especially in the touchdown column. So his worst year that he actually played, uh, he hit four touchdowns twice. That would be his second year and his fourth year. Uh, MVS has... Two years where he had three touchdowns apiece. Oh, no, sorry, that's Alan Lazard. Uh, Alan Lazard, in his rookie season, didn't really play. He played one game. And then he caught three touchdowns and three touchdowns. Obviously, injuries were a big issue last year. I think he was on pace. I mean, he got hurt week three and missed like half the like eight weeks and then came back in week, I want to say, 10. So I think if you extrapolate the uh, path he was on and also take out the time where he was back on the team or back on the field, but clearly not himself and struggling due to that uh, core muscle injury. Um, I think eight is like the ceiling for what he could have gotten. I think you're looking at probably six or seven touchdowns last year. So um, Funches is, is probably the second most productive guy on the team after uh, Devante um, in the wide receiver room. Yardage, he is putting up about the same number of yards as uh, MVS, and both of them are putting up quite a bit more yards than Alan Lazard is. So if he comes in, if he's healthy, if he um, is is running the correct routes and earns the trust of the coaching staff to put him out there. I think he can be a a consistent producer for the Packers and hit 500 yards and five touchdowns. Um, That's a little bit less than your traditional wide receiver two in the league. I think average wide receiver two numbers are around 800 yards and six touchdowns. He is a good route runner and that matters. Either way, obviously, like I said, the first step is making the roster, but then if he does, I'm actually excited for what he can do. Uh, it'd be nice to see if he can. I, I So I, I think that 500 yards and five touchdowns, I think that is like right about where I would expect him to be. Anything above that, I'd be pretty excited about. All right, here's an interesting, no, here's a weird story. So the newest name to jump into the Aaron Rodgers drama is Ed Rodgers, Aaron's dad. He has been uh, active on Twitter, defending his son and criticizing the Packers and the media. Before I touch on what he said, uh, here's his most recent comment on the entire situation. One of his, I think it's one of his friends, tags him in an article that's written about his tweets. 
And Ed replies and said, while I didn't expect to get headlines, I really try to stay mum on most of these issues, but I get tired of some folks bashing my son. Most folks don't think about the fact that a player's dad could be checking out the comments. Some are really brutal. I'm sure you can agree that the typical fan base cares more about the player than the person, while parents care more about the person than the player. So when a fan base starts trashing a player after years of faithful service, yeah, it makes a parent really ticked off. It's not quite what he said, but paraphrasing. Now, in response to the article saying that uh, Ed Rogers is going on an anti-Packers tirade, uh, here's another another comment from Mr. Rogers on the article. Yeah, you're right. I overreacted. The fan base there is pretty awesome. Although it was really weird with the transition from Favre to Aaron, he had death threats and people calling him ugly names and booing him, etc. That was a pretty lousy fan base, wouldn't you agree? Can we just take a second and recognize that, uh, <laughs> and I'm a, I'm certainly guilty of this, recognize that we don't treat most of these athletes like people. My hope here is that Ed's comments are speaking to you as uh, deeply and personally as it did to me. I don't think that my added commentary is going to add anything. For all of these reasons, I'm not going to read his tweets that are attacking the Packers. They're very mild. Uh, I think just about everybody listening to this podcast has at some point said some version of most of the things he's saying, and it's okay to change your mind over time. Uh, I think the Packers have big enough shoulders to take it when you critique the front office, and then uh, when they get things right, don't give them credit. I read a bunch of his Packers slash Rogers tweets. Um, they're... They're not interesting. I'm, I'm not recommending that you go read them. Um, I, I, I've read them for you, and they're not interesting. <clears throat> he is very, very much in support of his son. And I think they're kind of revealing that he does not have, uh, <laughs> to, to, to borrow Aaron Rodgers' own quote, uh, a high football IQ. I don't think Ed knows much about football. He seems like a good guy. Seems like he really cares a lot about his son. Defends him in the comments on a ton of articles. Again, the comments are not interesting. This is definitely a guy who gets like all of his football analysis from watching ESPN. I mean, all of it. I mean, he's offering up uh, football wisdom that is just blatantly not true. Like... Uh, for example, you can't trade compensatory picks. Well, that's absolutely not true. You can trade them. Here's the only interesting comment that I found. Uh, he says, I have inside information you wouldn't believe. What a circus it was under McCarthy. Hard to believe we won anything except for Aaron putting the team on his back. A consolation prize for semi-interesting comments. Uh he says, actually, I'm proud of my son for finally speaking out. The team hasn't gotten him help in forever. Um, looking at the comments, if you took the word my son out of all of these, these would be identical to anything you would ever find like on Facebook. I did find that in, that line about uh, I have inside information about what it's like under McCarthy. I mean, obviously, we know who his inside source is. Uh, you know, for all the talk about Rogers having a crappy relationship with his family, somebody didn't tell Ed. He seems to think that uh, he cares a lot about his son, does not seem to be um, upset with him or estranged. They sure seem to be in touch, certainly in touch enough that he's going into the comments of like 500 different articles that were written about him. One thing I think is hilarious, and, and I don't think this should change. Like, don't don't go follow him for this reason. But um, you know, he doesn't doesn't have any uh, really any followers, and nobody realizes who they're talking to. So uh, he's he's fighting with somebody in the comments of a uh, Rob Domofsky tweet, and 
ends it by saying, actually, my son plays for the team, dummy, so you shut up. I'm way more invested than you are. Is there anything to learn from all this um, in regards to the Aaron Rodgers situation with the Packers? I think not. There's nothing revealing in here. Um, Ed is uh, very much in favor of Aaron going to a different team if that's what Aaron wants to do. I, I don't see any suggestions that Aaron should do it. I There are people who tweet and say, you know, why would Aaron want to leave? And Ed basically goes... Uh, you know, like any team would be uh, lucky to have him. And the 49ers, if they had drafted him in the first place, would have won more Super Bowls, yada, yada. Is he anti-Packers? From the comments I'm reading, I would not say he's any more anti-Packers than like your average Packers fan on Twitter or Facebook. A lot of criticism, um, but... You know, it's to be expected when his son is at odds with the team right now, and and I don't see anything in here to indicate like a a deep long term dislike of the team. He seems to be a fan of the team as long as his son is there. So, like I said, I read off the only interesting tweets. I do not recommend. You know, like let's let's not go turn him into an internet thing. Uh, I I think him kind of flying under the radar is a a. Good thing, probably the best thing for the situation. But it was interesting to to uh, hear the a couple little things and also to find out that, you know, as far as Ed is concerned, he, he's completely in support of his son and does not appear to feel that he is estranged from him. So dude's just talking about his son like any other dad I've ever, ever read. And if you criticize his son, he's going to call you a dummy. That's, uh, well, a, a, a PG version of dummy and i think that's fine i think that's great all right i'm gonna take our last ad break and then we got a couple more things we're gonna wrap up with got another anonymous question here uh do you think we see aj dylan used in more goal line packages kind of hard for me to want to take aaron jones off the field uh, in those goal line situations because he's so good. He's got a nose for the end zone. I mean, like you look at, at most of the uh, touchdowns we've seen over the years, he's got a lot of just, you know, two, three yard, uh, and just run a quick uh, outside zone and bop right into the end zone. I don't know who does it better. I would like to put both of them on the field in that situation and then give the ball to Aaron Jones. Dude, think about what you could do with this. My gosh. Okay. Uh, goal line situation. You got Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon both on the field. Obviously, you're not pulling Devontae Adams or uh, Robert Tunyon off the field at this point. Who is the defense going to key in on? I mean, you, worst case scenario in their minds is they ignore A.J. Dillon and he just barrels through and knocks over the one or two defenders who are kind of in, in position to touch him. You can fake the handoff to him. You can hand the ball off to Aaron Jones. You can pass the ball to Aaron Jones. Or you got great red zone receiving threats. And once in a while, to keep the uh, defense honest, give the ball to A.J. Dillon, let him punch through Derrick Henry style and just obliterate a guy. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't think the bar for Jordan Love as a starter has to be very high because of the absurd talent everywhere else on the team and also the very quarterback-friendly scheme that Matt LaFleur is running, which, by the way, is a very similar type of, of offense to what Jordan ran in, uh, in uh, Utah State. By the way, prediction, I think in one of these sort of situations, uh, A.J. Dillon is going to have a receiving touchdown, like in the end zone. He's a, a, a very underrated receiving back. I think most folks do not recognize that he has that in his arsenal, uh, but he is he is a very good receiver. At least by running back standards, he, he is a better receiver than I think he, he has any credit for. Linebacker Devondre Campbell. I was not thrilled about the signing. I don't think uh, a lot of folks were. Bill Huber over at SportsIllustrated.com uh, talked to some NFL scouts around the league 
and asked for their opinion on Devondre Campbell. The scouts were pretty high on him. They specifically brought up his uh, embarrassingly low PFF grades, and they kind of the, the the scouts' opinion was that PFF was kind of missing the mark here and was not uh, taking everything into account. So this is not my opinion. This is the scouts' opinion, NFL scouts' opinion. So um, let's see, a scouting director in the NFL said this is a really good signing. He is athletic. He can cover. A little weak in the run game, but it's good value. He's a little underrated. So at that price, it's a pretty good signing. Uh, it is true he doesn't cost much money. I'm not thrilled that they added all of the void years to his contract, but in terms of actual money, it's like $2 million bucks. He's a former fourth-round pick in 2016. He started 70 games in the last five seasons. He is a very versatile linebacker. One of the things that the scouts um, highlighted is that uh, he's very long, has a lot of length, and he's very athletic. And Atlanta and Arizona like to put him in tougher matchups. This is a guy who was uh, beating out Isaiah Simmons in Arizona for snaps. His coverage grades are mediocre, um, but the scout was quick to point out that, okay, you're you're not putting him in coverage against the guys you would typically put a middle linebacker in cover in coverage against. You're matching him up against uh, you know tough uh, wide receivers and tight ends. I could see him being your three down linebacker. His length really can make things difficult on quarterbacks, and he tackles well, too. So even when he does give up a catch, he usually limits the damage. Now, here's a countering point. Uh, He's not a great player, but he's probably better than what you've had, which I can't argue with. He was the 31st ranked linebacker in the league in tackles. He had 97 tackles last season. Um, he had, he ranked 11th in yards allowed per snap at 5.5. That's not bad at all. And in completion, he ranked 13th completion rate of 65.9%. Both of those numbers are much better than, uh, Chris Barnes, who gave up an 87.5% catch rate and 7.1 yards per target. So we're looking at nearly two yards fewer and, over 20%, 22% uh, lower uh, catch rate percentage. Actually, I don't don't know why they phrased it that way. It's completion percentage. According to PFF, Campbell allowed 13 of 25 passing when in man coverage. Of the 61 linebackers to play at least 220 overall coverage snaps, that 52% ranked 7th. On the other hand, he finished 53rd with an 87.5% completion rate in zone. Those 8.6 cover coverage snaps per reception was a bit better than average. So, um, with, armed with all this information, it is a good signing when you look at how little money we're paying him and when you look at the other linebackers in the room. Getting him in there with Joe Barry, who's a former linebackers coach, who has had great success with linebackers. Uh, I think you're getting a roughly almost Christian Kirksey level of player who might do better for us than Christian Kirksey did for like a quarter of the cost, not even. Campbell himself, by the way, when talking about uh, those, those tough matchups, he said, when I'm in coverage against tight ends, most of them are bigger guys. Ultimately, It's a mismatch if a safety or a corner is on them. It's not a mismatch with me because I can match up with them. Kind of a forgotten storyline with the Packers uh, because it wasn't a massive factor in 2020, although they didn't go up against a ton of good tight ends, Gronkowski being kind of the only one, and he dominated. Um, The Packers have struggled against tight ends the last two years. In 2019, it was a massive problem, but they were going up against, like, all the best tight ends. They went up against Zach Ertz, who was still really good that year. They played uh, Travis Kelsey. They played George Kittle. They played Darren Waller. They played all the good tight ends in 2019. Got murdered by all of them. 
And then uh, in 2020, I think the only really good tight ends they played were Janu Smith and Rob Gronkowski. Does anybody in the NFC North have good tight ends? Not really. You got Jimmy Graham. Uh, Vikings don't have anybody. TJ Hawkinson isn't that good. He didn't really do anything against us. Um, so it is what it is. Campbell is a, is a better signing than I initially gave him credit for. And and I enjoyed reading this. It made me more interested in seeing him uh, on the field. I'm not expecting him to be a superstar. But let's get some like just competent NFL caliber linebacker play for once. And I think... Again, having Joe Barry uh, be the defensive coordinator could be an interesting wrinkle there. The guy has worked with linebackers for forever. I have to imagine that he cares about the linebacker position. Let's see what Devondre Campbell can do. Final thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, Aaron Rodgers made an interesting comment last year. Remember, you had the, the CBA talks, the new collective bargaining agreement between the NFL and the Players Association negotiating a new 10-year agreement between both parties. Aaron Rodgers declined to show up to any of the meetings until the final one. When he shows up, makes a a plea to the players, tries to make a big argument to them that they should not sign this new CBA because he doesn't think they're getting enough and he wants to do away with voluntary... um, OTAs and uh, off-season requirements. I think he's not a fan at all of the preseason games. You, uh, most of the stuff in the off-season and preseason, Aaron Rodgers is like vehemently opposed to. Which is interesting when a year later he is not attending any of them. I don't think it's unrelated. I don't think it's the reason he's not there. Clearly the reason he's not there is because he has beef with the Packers front office and wants something from them in order for him to show up. But I don't think that he's at all disappointed to be missing out. Um, When will Aaron Rodgers show back up? Because uh, the odds makers in Vegas do believe he will show up. Uh, The odds that he chooses to sit out the season they have set at plus 250, which is not fantastic odds. They believe that he is going to show up on August 28th, that's the uh, average. The over-under is August 28th. That is the date of Green Bay's preseason finale, the final game of the preseason. He's obviously not a fan of preseason football. Um, I don't think that he has any intention of playing any snaps in the preseason. Uh, I've kind of said all along that I thought he would show up week two of the preseason which is just one week earlier than this. So it, it, it's possible, um, you know, week two or week three. Of course, we don't have four preseason games anymore because we have a an, an, uh, 17th regular season game. I had a question in the Facebook group that was related to this. Actually, two very similar questions. So from Gerard Collins, if Rodgers is back for training camp, who is our starting quarterback for preseason games? Uh, that would be Jordan Love, like no matter what. Uh, that's my answer. And if Rogers starts the regular season, does Love see any game time at all? I'm talking in blowout games. Uh, well, he should be quarterback number two. So any of the situations where you would traditionally see Tim Boyle, I think you'll see Jordan Love. I don't think uh, the odds that they bench Rogers late in a blowout and let Love come in and um, uh, take the offense for a series or two. Uh, sure. Why not? Uh, I think we had uh, Tim Boyle did that. I don't know if he did it in 2020. I think he did it in 2019 one time though. So sure, absolutely. Um, are, are they gonna Are they gonna take Rogers off the field just to give Love some playing time? No. Are they gonna take Rogers off the field because the game is in the bag and there's no sense in risking injury to Aaron Rodgers? Absolutely. Zachary Spees. If Rodgers skips all of training camp slash preseason and then comes re- comes back right before the season, do you think we should start him week one? Absolutely. Uh, does Aaron Rodgers need the preseason in order to... Um, well, I guess here's the question. The question is, is how well-versed is Rodgers in the 
in the 2021 offense at that point. Um, he's still the starter week one, no matter what. You're not starting Jordan Love if Rodgers is, you know, there, healthy, reporting, ready to play. You know, he like he says he's ready to play. Uh, I would be surprised if Matt LaFleur is not sending Rodgers information about the playbook. <laughs> you know, send him the playbook. Say, hey, here's, uh, here's what we're studying. Hope you will follow along from afar. I got to imagine he's doing that because it would be weird if he's not. Um, unless he just is completely sure that Rodgers is not coming back. And I, I don't think that's the case. But I think, you know, he's got the... I think he's got his new offense that he wants to run this year. You know, the new wrinkles and everything to his offense, the new terminology. I'm, I'm sure he's, you know, emailing that to Rodgers. I'm sure he's including notes, asking for input. Why? Because that's kind of how LaFleur rolls. Um, he heavily involved Rodgers the last two years in creating the offense. So if Rodgers is, is not participating in that virtually, which we haven't heard anything about him doing that, I'm sure LaFleur is at least CCing him on all this stuff. Rodgers is a smart guy. I would not be surprised if the first week or two of the season uh, is a little rough and he's not all the way in sync, not totally dialed in with what everybody else on the team is doing, but he's smart. He can pick up a new playbook pretty quickly. We did see in 2019, you know, he had the whole offseason to learn the new offense and it didn't all take. There was still some uh, some learning curve, some development um, that needed to happen there. You might see a similar thing here with him just kind of missing an entire offseason when they have kind of changed and tweaked the offense and added new players and everybody else has been all practicing together. So unless Rodgers shows up like at the beginning of training camp, yeah, I would expect the first week or two to be kind of rough, but no question he's the starting quarterback no matter what. All right, I got to get out of here. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. I will catch you all uh, tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.